studios in London. This is Charlie Rose. John Major was Prime Minister of Great Britain for seven years. He succeeded Margaret Thatcher after her resignation in 1990. He led the Conservative Party to a surprise victory in 1992. Earlier this year, he left 10 Downing Street after a landslide win by the Labour Party in the May elections. Under his administration, Britain saw victory in the Persian Gulf, the signing of the Maastricht Treaty, the opening of talks in Northern Ireland, and economic growth. He continues to serve his country as a member of Parliament. Meanwhile, speculations about his future plans remain plentiful. I'm pleased to have him on this program on day four of our visit to London. Mr. Prime Minister, I'm pleased to have you on our program. Nice to be here. Uh, how goes life after 10 Downing? Oh, there's plenty of life after, uh, after being in Downing Street. I was in the government successively. I myself was personally in the government successively for 14 years, 10 years in the cabinet, and getting on for seven years in Downing Street. So that's a fair old slice of your life. So I remain in politics, of course, but there are plenty of things to do outside, uh, outside government. Have you given up the idea of being prime minister again? Oh, I don't uh, expect or wish to be prime minister again. I think that things move on been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Yes. So I think, it's time, it, I think it's time to move on. There are other things to do. There are many things that I've had to put aside during the 14 years of government. I'm looking forward to enjoying those. Well, pr President Clinton was interviewed on American television recently. He said, after eight years as president, what might you do? And might you run for the Senate or something? He said he didn't think he'd run for the Senate, but perhaps the uh, school board for the Board of <laughs> Education. <laughs> well, I think he's got the right sort of values. I think that's right. Yeah. When you've been prime minister or been president, I think other jobs don't really, other political jobs have a much, uh, much lesser appeal. Uh, as a member of parliament, serving my constituents and serving in the House of Commons, that's a particular dimension. Yeah. But I think moving beyond that dimension back into government doesn't have uh, very great attractions at the moment. Let me talk about one of the things that was victory while you were prime minister, uh, the Gulf War, mm. uh, and the victory over Saddam Hussein at that time. And look at the events today, knowing mm -hmm. that you are not being briefed every day, knowing that you have a lot of other things to do and you're not keeping up with it minute by minute. Having said that, what do you think is important for the United States and its primary ally, Great Britain, to keep in mind as these negotiations take place? Well, I think the first thing you need to keep in mind is that Saddam Hussein is a destabilizing force. He's a very dangerous man. He's a very irrational man. And he's been manufacturing weapons of mass destruction. And you need to keep a very firm eye on what he's doing. So I personally believe the United States have been absolutely right, absolutely right beyond a doubt, to take a pretty tough line, to say we must have the inspections, we must have a strong United States contingent in the inspections, key thing is to have the right people there. But we must have those inspections and we must have access. To back off and say, well, this is all getting too difficult, we don't want to cause a fuss now, and open up the possibility of these weapons of mass destruction uh, continually to be manufactured would be very dangerous. I recall in the Gulf how worried we were that he might have a delivery system for chemical or biological weapons. So I think while that danger exists in that uh, extraordinarily uh, extraordinary area of potential turmoil in the Middle East, I think there is not a shred of doubt in my mind that President Clinton, Prime Minister Tony Blair and the others are right to take the tough line they've taken. At what, under what circumstances should they uh, engage in the use of force? Well, clearly they'd rather deal with it diplomatically and at the moment it looks as though uh, with, the, um, uh, with the intercession of uh, Primakov, it looks as though there may be some form of diplomatic agreement. That is undoubtedly the first prize. But I don't think any sensible Western politician would set out criteria under which force would be used, because to do so would be indica to indicate in what circumstances force would not be used. So I think it's necessary to leave that prospect in the background if all else fails. Can and that is exactly, is exactly what the uh, Western allies have done. It's the right thing to do. Can the allies and those people in the Middle East who want to see some progress on issues of war and peace mm. uh, afford to have Saddam Hussein with the capacity to deliver weapons of mass destruction, including germ and biological warfare. Can they afford to have him with that potential? I think it would be very dangerous if he were able to build up that potential. Now, I'm no longer exactly certain what the latest intelligence is, and I make that point entirely clear. I'm not privy to what information would be available to the President and to the Prime Minister. But that he was manufacturing those weapons 
I think is beyond doubt. And if he is manufacturing those weapons, presumably without let and hindrance, he would go on manufacturing them. So I think it's necessary to take action now to indicate, firstly, the danger to the rest of the world. And I think they've been alerted to it by what has happened over the last few weeks. And secondly, to make it perfectly clear to Saddam Hussein, and I think it is Saddam Hussein rather than the Iraqi nation, I think there's a clear distinction to be drawn there, to make it perfectly clear to Saddam Hussein that the United States, Great Britain and the others are perfectly well aware of what he's doing. They haven't forgotten what he might do with those weapons because we saw what he did in Kuwait in the early part of uh, this decade. And if necessary, they're prepared to be as tough in future as they were in the past. I hope that won't be necessary. Mm -hmm. At the moment, it looks a touch more promising. But if necessary, uh, the use of force must be in the background. Should the Gulf War that you were a uh, significant party to mm -hmm and leadership of your country and what you contributed in the United States have continued longer than it did. Did we end that war early? It couldn't have done. And I will explain to you why it couldn't have done. When the coalition uh, was created by, by President Bush in the early 90s, we operated under international law. And the international law we operated under was the United Nations resolution. That resolution was what brought the coalition together. That was the legal binding for it. And that resolution was to get the Iraqis out of Kuwait. It was not a resolution that empowered the Allies to go into Baghdad and drag Saddam Hussein out by the feet. Now, if we had done that, firstly, we would have exceeded international law. Secondly, we would have broken up the coalition. Thirdly, a lot of American, British, and other troops would have been killed. And fourthly, you would very probably have united a large part of the Arab world against the coalition and because they were against the coalition, by definition, with Saddam Hussein. Would that would not, in my judgment, have been smart politics. And the other point about it really is this. The generals on the ground, whom politicians ignore, I think, at their peril on these occasions, as I recall it, they were unanimous that they had completed the task that they were given and that it was necessary to call a halt to the war. And that was the view that uh, they had at the time. It was the view President Bush took that I took. And I think it's only with that marvelous ingredient of complete hindsight that people say go further. But even then, if the president had tried to go further, he would not have been able to do so legally. He would not have been able to keep the coalition together. And that's really the key point. Suppose there is a Primakov kind of brokered deal of some kind in which sanctions eventually might come off if Saddam behaves and does what he's supposed to do. Inspectors go back in there with no uh, resistance from him, and everybody in the Security Council sort of signs off on this, and there is no U.S. or allied use of force. Mm. And it would be a very different use of force this time because it's not going to be the same coalition, mm. probably only the United States and Britain and perhaps Israel. What's going to happen, do you think? I mean, how do you see this thing being playing out? Well. From all we know of Saddam Hussein, he will consistently push up against the limits of tolerance. He has in the past, he is doing now, and you could not be certain that he wouldn't do so again. It isn't a question of saying, that's what we'll do, this is the end of it. It isn't quite like that. I'm afraid this is very possibly going to be an irritation that will occur at some stage again in the future. But that doesn't mean that you can just say, oh, heck, what can we do? It's a difficulty. We may have to do it again. Let's let him get on with it. You can't do that. You can't do that. And sometimes the only thing you can do is imperfect, but it is right. And of course, what the British and the Americans, the Americans and the British are doing at the moment, may be seen by some to be imperfect, but it is the best and only option in the uh, world of real politics that the president has. Has he won, though, because he's had this 10 to no. 15 days to, no, in a sense, hide something that might have been available well, otherwise? Won. No, he hasn't won. I mean, he's, he's had a period of another 10 or 15 days with the world looking at him, and I have no doubt that he rather enjoys that. The guy's a megalomaniac. But no, he hasn't won. Once again, the world has been able to focus on what's happening in Iraq and the potential wickedness of Saddam Hussein. The British and the Americans are perfectly clear about that wickedness. I think their persuasive power has persuaded Primakov to sure. take a very direct role. So no, he hasn't won. Mm. He hasn't won. He's once again uh, woken up a large part of the world to the potential risk that uh, And perhaps that made, us, made us more vigilant in watching him closer. There's always the danger, as time moves on, that vigilance slips. Now, it hasn't slipped. Self-evidently, it hasn't slipped because of the way the Americans and the British have been behaving. Would we all be better off if somebody in, in his own country or somebody from outside assassinated him? 
Well, it depends who he's replaced by. But if you mean, is he a democratic leader with whom we would find it easy to do business and whose word we could trust, the answer is no, he's not democratic. No, we can't do business with him. And no, we can't trust him. Mm. Let me move to two big political issues here in, in your country. Uh, one is European Monetary Union. Uh, the Labour Party seems to have adopted a position of let's wait and see. Uh, you have strongly said uh, in what I have read in the last <coughs> couple of months that whatever reservation you had, your answer today would be no, and let's not leave any hesitation about it. We should not. We should be more than Eurosceptic. We should say no to a Euro currency. For a long Do time. Do I get your policy right? It, well, I, I think it's a slightly, if I may say okay. so, it's slightly more complex than that. Okay. It depends on the time scale you take. For a long time, I have followed a policy that people characterized as wait and see. It was actually negotiate right. and decide, but they right. called it wait and see. And the Labour Party and others often criticized it. In government, now they have to look at the national interest. They have decided to adopt exactly the policy that uh, they managed to avoid publicly announcing in the past and which caused so much criticism of the last Conservative government. They have done that. They have broadly stuck to the policy that I had. The distinction that there is between the present Labour government and the position I now take is that we are now within 14 months of the target date for the establishment of a single currency right across Europe. We now have the economic information in front of us. And upon the basis of the economic information in front of us, I say it is not economically ready. The economic information we have in front of us is a, a Britain in full economic growth and recovery. Well, no, and, I'm looking at the whole, certainly Britain, but I was looking at the whole of, of, of Europe. Right. The idea is that the whole of Western Europe abolish the Deutsche Mark, abolish the Franc, abolish the Lira, uh, abolish the pound sterling, and replace it with a new currency with the truly ghastly name of the Euro. Yes. Now, that is what is intended to happen for everybody who's able to join on the 1st of January, 1999. Now, I don't think that Britain should join. Britain shouldn't join for a range of reasons. It's economically better placed than most nations at the moment, but I don't think it should join because the European nations themselves have not reached the right state of economic convergence. Their economies are not performing comparably. So it is, in the end, a difference in terms of where the economies are today. Yeah, the economies are in a different stage of the cycle. So you accept a strong currency for something that's less strong because of the difference in the economy. Well, let's take monetary policy, for example. If you have a single currency, you have a single level of interest rates right the way across Europe. The interest rates appropriate for Germany are not the interest rates appropriate for Italy. So what will happen? They'll pick something in the middle. They'll have a level of interest rates that is appropriate neither for Italy nor for Germany in terms of growth, in terms of supply-side efficiencies. The economies are not performing remotely the same. If anybody says to me that the economies of some of the southern European states are in a position to compete with Germany, France and the United Kingdom with a fixed exchange rate, then I would say they're not. Emphatically, they're not. And if they're locked together in the same exchange rate, too soon, I emphasize the point, too soon, then what will happen is the different economic performance will appear in the real economy. And by that, I mean the less well-performing countries won't be able to sell their goods. They'll get very high levels of unemployment, probably across a large part of southern Europe. Now, this, I think, is very damaging. And if the euro goes ahead on the 1st of January 1999, it will go ahead because the politicians have made a political decision that it should go ahead, not because the economic circumstances are right, which is what we always said in the but past. But they would argue happen. the following, as you know better than I do, much better than I do. I mean, Ken Clark was here, who's a strong adherent. Uh, and this battle has... Not for 1999, he isn't. But I in mean, terms Ken, of the idea Ken's of... Ken's an adherent of the principle. Right. He, is not a, he does not believe that Britain should go in in 1999. I agree with that. I mean, he said that, in fact. Yeah. But he does believe strongly in Europe, and he believes that there is to be the benefits of being part of Europe far outweigh the disadvantages. I believe Why, that, too. You believe that, too? Sure. So it's only a matter of the monetary union that you are resistant to. I am a convinced European. I am not convinced about economic and monetary union. Let me turn to Northern Ireland within the time considerations we have. Are you hopeful? George Mitchell was here. He says he's hopeful. That they, that they are making progress. And he gives great credit to you for what you did, as well as, in a sense, what Tony Blair has done well, following you. Well, this is a bipartisan matter. When I was Prime Minister, I got very strong support from Tony Blair as leader of the opposition. And insofar as I can give support for the right policies, I will continue to has do Has he so. done the right thing so far? I have no complaints about the way he's handled it so far. Well, and and going to Ireland and shaking and I, hands and with Sinn Féin and I all think, that. I think we are making progress. I suspect... I've always been wary of uh, making uh, predictions about this.
but I suspect we may be moving towards the end game. Now, it will not be perfect. It may take some time. It may take a year, it may take two years. It may not be perfect. There may be people who will split off and not accept any deal that could be done. But I think, despite the difficulties, despite the grumpy atmosphere that occasionally prevails and the sullenness that you sometimes see between the parties to the talks, they're still there. They are sitting together. And I think we could be in the early stages of an end game. So I share the same view as George Mitchell. Um, I'm not hugely optimistic it's going to happen very swiftly. Before, May, before May 1998? Well it, well, it could. There's no logical reason why it couldn't happen if the participants in the talks decided to take their courage in their hands and say to their own target audiences, this is the best we can get, we should take it. But that asks for a lot of courage from everybody sitting around that table, from the unionists, from the republicans. But do you have any Shinfeng. reason to believe that there is, there is a feeling of fatigue with war and we're tired of violence and therefore we're willing to take that step? Now? I have always believed that the, what will provide the thrust to bring this wretched dispute for so many years to a conclusion is the determination of the everyday people of Northern Ireland who are not politically engaged in a, in a, in a high profile way, the determination of those people that, that uh, their part of the United Kingdom but, should get an end to this But violence. you never expect them to take a vote to change the constitutional relationship that I will don't. change it because no. of the majority of the Protestants. I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, the majority of the Protestants are going to uh, vote uh, to remain within the United Kingdom. But in the, the mid-1990s, I reached an agreement with the uh, then Irish government called the Framework Document. Right. The Framework Document, following on the Downing Street Declaration of the early 1990s, are the two key documents. The Framework Document set out a blueprint of what a settlement might look like. It isn't perfect for anyone. The Unionists aren't going to dance in the street, neither are the Republicans. But it provides a sufficiency. If there is a will for peace, I enter that preposition if, if there is a will for peace, and if the public pressure remains that could bring about a settlement. Now, I'm hopeful that that can be done. Whether it will be done depends upon two things. Depends upon the skill of the negotiators, and it also depends upon the courage of the participants. Because sitting back as an observer, I can see exactly what I saw when I sat in Downing Street. It will need courage amongst the people sitting around that table, Republican and Unionist alike, to actually reach a deal. There will be people who are willing to leave the table and threaten you if you stay. I think that's very likely. I think it's very likely. And I think it's very likely in some cases that people might get threatened for the deal that they reached, if they reached a deal. I think that is possible. That is why I say they need courage. I think they need uh, intellectual courage to realize that they've got to compromise. Nobody is going to get out of this exactly what they want. Nobody. And that's, going a, to that's the other reality you have there to come go. to. You have to come to that reality. That's always been the case. And that From the moment we embarked upon this in the early 90s, that has always been the case. So it's going to have to be compromised. So the now, IRA and all of the Catholics in Northern Ireland are going to have to realize there will be no change in the constitutional form so that they become part well, they have been saying of Ireland. occasionally, and then they've moved away from it. But they've said from time to time they accept the principle of consent. The principle of consent means the people in Northern Ireland will determine their own constitutional future. Now, the majority no of the people in majority, Northern Ireland. Yes, you, you accept by majority rule. That's the way your system works in the United States and ours in the United Kingdom. It's the way it works in the Republic of Ireland. The majority determine matters like this. That's why I promised a referendum in whenever it was, 1995, the present government have inherited that policy, right. they've endorsed promise. that policy. Right. And anybody who believes that we can produce out of uh, this omelette a series of fresh eggs back in their shells with no difficulty and no compromise, it just is not possible. But the with compromise, there is a possibility of a deal. There's a book out called Major, A Political Life by Anthony Zell, in which you cooperated with him and he taught you uh, in which he did interviews with you about your life. Tell me what you are proudest of in terms of your tenure. Uh, you've served as a member of parliament, you served in a number of, of, of lesser <coughs> sub-cabinet levels, you were chancellor of the Exchequer, and you were also foreign minister, and then you were prime minister for six years. What is it that you are most pleased about? What achievement, what success, what accomplishment? Well, I wish I could have finished the Irish negotiations, but if we put that to one side, I think the um, 
I have no doubt, that the thing I'm most proud of is turning this country from a country prone to high inflation and all the economic un inefficiencies and unemployment that followed that to a country that now has stable, low inflation and a much higher level of our people in jobs, much higher, in fact, than anywhere else in Europe. I'm proud of that absolutely economic sea change that was brought at a considerable amount of pain and political unpopularity. But it has changed our economic prospects, not just for the short term, but for the long term. And what is it you regret the most? Well, I regret that I wasn't able to finish the Irish negotiations. I had hoped we would be able to do that. We had made a lot of progress. Then we had setbacks. I always thought there would be setbacks. But if I had one wish, it would have been to have successfully completed those negotiations and ended the bloodshed in Northern Ireland. It is no more tolerable there than it would be if it was Surrey or Sussex or London. Mm. Uh, I wish we could talk about Bison, but let me just... This, Hugo Young, who you know, wrote a piece for The New Yorker and is writing a piece about Europe. He said, the British economy is booming. This was before the election in 1997, which you lost in a landslide. The British economy is booming. London is once again trendy, and everyone thinks that Prime Minister John Major is a very nice man. So why does it seem he is likely to lose, which in fact you did? Why did you years. lose? 18 years, I think, is a simple answer. 18 years? Not of quite a simple. Tory We had had 18 years of successive government by one political party. That is pretty unprecedented in the British, the British system. Uh, I think you've seen the same thing after eight or 12 years, often in the uh, United States system. After 18 years, there were no great problems. There was no great inflationary difficulty. I think people said, well, the country's in pretty good shape. There's no risk. But We're I tired with these boring old faces that we've had for the last part of the yeah. last 18 years. Let's try something new and fresh. And of course, there were other things about but it as well. Uh, but I think me. that was the biggest single ingredient. But it is my understanding that the way politics work, if your country is doing well and people think that they are in prosperity, they want to retain the status yes. quo, it's, no matter how long they've had it. Why am I wrong about that? Well, because you're talking of the sheer length of time. If it had been four years or eight as years... As it was for President Clinton. Four years or eight years, I think yeah. that would have been right. I mean, most people expected us to lose in 1992. They did. They thought we'd lose in 1992 because yeah. we'd been there 13 years. Right. Well, we won in 1992. We defied uh, political gravity. Yeah. But I think but people say the reason you won in 1992 on this program since I've been here is because you went out and the way you campaigned. I mean, Ken Clark and others have come here to this broadcast yeah. and say that you were out there. Why didn't that work four years later, five years later? Well, it was five years later. Yeah. I mean, I think it was five years later, and it had been a very tough five years. You see, I think there's a, there's, you're quite right in saying the economy was in very good shape. But in getting it into very good shape, we upset a lot of people. We cut public expenditure in areas where people cherished public expenditure. We had to put taxes up when we didn't wish to put taxes up. We had to take a whole series of deeply painful decisions that upset a lot of people right across the United Kingdom. Yeah. Now, they may have come right, but the bruises often remain. I didn't expect to have to do that. I didn't wish to do it, but the recession forced it upon us. And the only way to get the economy right was to take those tough decisions, and we did it. But we, uh, we didn't win much affection for those tough decisions. People may have said the economy is right, but after so long in government, I think there was a disinclination to give us credit for the fact that we'd taken tough decisions and that we'd got the economy right. And I'm disappointed in that. So you said but they didn't quite give you credit for the things you've done I have and to say blamed I understand you for the that. things that cause pain. Well, that's political life, yeah. I'm afraid, sometimes. Uh, I, again, I mentioned Ken Clark because he is a member of your party, and I, we have a tape of him on this broadcast, which I want to show in just a moment. How much were you damaged by division within your party? It was material. It was material. Significant? Yes, significant. I think we would have lost the election. I don't think the divisions alone lost us the election. I think 18 years in power lost the election. What the divisions did was turn an election defeat into a much bigger election defeat. What's very striking is that Labour had this huge majority in 1997, but they polled fewer votes than I polled, than the Conservative Party polled in 1992, when we had a very tiny majority. So there wasn't a great feeling for Labour. What there was was a feeling of change, a feeling of weariness with the Conservatives, and I think a certain amount of frustration, maybe even distaste, with uh, some of the divisions that they had seen in the party, predominantly over this great issue of Europe. Europe. All right. Roll tape. Here is what uh, Ken Clark, Member of Parliament, said on this program earlier this week. Tell me what happened to your party.
Uh, we almost have a single party here in Britain today. Well, the party, that, yes, we had, well, that's partly because the Labour Party changed. The Labour Party moved sharply to the right, and Tony Blair occupied the ground, which used to be occupied by what are called One Nation Conservatives, the more moderate, normally the governing wing of the Conservative Party. In rhetoric and style, he moved onto that centre ground position, a bit right of centre, which is a wholly new political position for the Labour Party. Meanwhile, the Conservative Party sort of fell apart before his eyes but you and fell into internal <laughs> dissent, uh, mainly divided over Europe, exacerbated by the fall of Margaret Thatcher, exacerbated by the humiliation of Black Wednesday when we were driven out of the ERM. And so the final years of the last parliament, you had a governing party that just simply could not be led by John Major to start preparing to fight an election. They wanted to fight each other on doctrinal issues, mainly turning on the European Union. Well, I think Ken puts it a little more sharply than I would, but I think the substance of it is right. We were taking the right policy decisions. The economy was turning in the right direction. But this issue of Europe ran so deep that it created uh, feuds and difficulties on a scale we've never, well, I say we've never seen before. Only three times in the long history of British politics has there been a dispute like this. Once in 1840s with the Corn Laws, once with tariff reform at the turn of the century, and this time with Europe. But the Europe dis dispute was made even worse because we now live in the era of mass communications. Every time someone was invited on the media, it was someone who disagreed with the party, right. not the majority of people who agreed with it. So it was uh, a very unattractive picture, even for those people who saw the economy was going right, education was improving, and the other improvements that we brought about. Even though Margaret Thatcher, Lady Thatcher, had been your political mentor, even though she had singled you out early and led to your taking significant positions of power in her cabinet. If she had done more, would you have won in 97? No, I, d I, I don't think we would have won in 1997. Looking back in retrospect, I would repeat what I actually said to Chris Patton the day after the election in 1992. It's going to be very difficult to do it a fifth time. We got through a fourth time, and nobody expected us to do to do it a fifth time was asking a very great deal, and as it proved, those words were very prescient indeed. What we didn't anticipate was the savage, savagery of the European debate. Yeah. But that was a gut issue, the European debate. Do you agree that the Blair government has in a sense assumed a center-right position, as many people have said, that basically there is a direct line between Thatcher and Blair through Major? <laughs> No, I don't. And, and they I are center-right and they preempted that position no, in the no. same way that President Clinton has in the politics of America, center, taking a center yeah. position, I think that's where elections yeah. are won. I agree with part of what you said, but I didn't agree with the conclusion you drew from it. If you mean, have the Labour Party realized that the Conservatives have won the intellectual argument and moved their political base onto our ground? I do mean that. They have done that. But when you say uh, Tony Blair follows Margaret Thatcher, that is not true. That there is a link between no. the policies that she... No, 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 no. He, he's adopted the policies that she had and I had. But right. we were both pushing those policies further. He spent all his political life opposing those policies, and he is not proposing to push them any further. Heaven alone knows. But he's not trying to turn them back. Well, he there's realizes no they're popular. There's no nationalization, he, well, for he example. Well, he realizes there's they're no. popular, but there's no more privatization either. He's not moving it So he's forward. now he's stopped. I at, don't know what the government will do when they run out of my policies. Well, that's I my point. I simply don't know well, what they're going to do. Is that, would that be I don't your... think they know what they're going to do either. <laughs> well, that's where I'm going. And to say yeah. that it's uh, um, the same sort of policies as Margaret Thatcher has followed. Or John I, Major. I'm just saying I a don't continuum. Think, or John Major. I don't think, um, I don't think the uh, devolution policies are anything well, that Margaret different. Thatcher or John Major would have actually and you, followed. And you very I'd much be, object to them. Oh, I think they're folly. Yes. I think they're folly. And I think there are other areas as well where promises have been made, but we'll see whether those promises are actually kept. We're in the early days of a government. It's the easy bit. The difficult bit is when you've been round the course for a year or so and your own words and your own actions come back, and then we will see whether there genuinely hasn't been a sea change in the Labour Party. There might have been. I don't know yet. There might have been. Whether well, you don't know yet if there's been a sea change I know there's been in a the Labour Party? I, I, mean, know, I know there's been a sea change in what the government and ministers say I don't know whether there's been a sea change in the nature of the Labour Party itself when they run into difficulties. That, you think they will that revert, is untested. They will revert to a, a, that is untested. I don't to a place they were before no, Tony Blair became... I don't think they're going to go back to being the very left-wing party they okay. once before. I don't think they're going to do that. 
But what are they going to revert to? I think they would move a little more centre-left rather than... More of a status party? I think they've got oratory on the centre-right. Whether their policies are on centre-right or centre-left yet remains to be tested. I think you may see a party that knows what needs to be said. They're extremely good at public relations and will pitch their oratory to the centre-right. But will they hack away at the welfare state? No sign of doing it yet. Will because they take those are hard choices. Uh, well, because they are the, they cho they're the choices of the centre-right. And I'm not sure that they'll actually make those centre-right choices. What would be choices. a test for the Labour government? What should we look for as a test as to whether... I don't think you can set a single test. I think it's a range of policies. What actually happens when there's uh, pressure in the, uh, in the uh, economy? How will they actually relax? How will they actually react when there's pressure for large inputs of money into certain areas of public services and it's potentially inflationary? Will they provide the money or will they not? Now there is a test. That is a test they will face at some stage in this when parliament. When they feel pressure from their normal constituents when they for find, public funding. When they find pressure from their normal constituents for public funding, yes. And you have seen no evidence of that so far in terms of welfare issues, well, but certainly in terms of rhetoric you've seen it. I've seen it in terms of rhetoric. I've seen it in terms of promises. Whether they will keep those promises, I don't know. They might. They might. And if they do, they'll have a long reign as uh, party well, in power. Not necessarily. That doesn't follow at all. The Conservative Party, many people said after 1945, was finished, was back within six years. You now, mean after the victory of Attlee over, over Churchill? Yeah. This, was, this is basically a conservative country that votes non-conservative from time to time. That's actually been the... Do you think America is basically a Republican country at the presidential level that votes Democratic? I'm, <laughs> no, well, you're very <laughs> tempting. But I'm not going to get into the divisions between Republican and Democrat in the United States. Uh, that's uh, certainly not for me. Has the Blair image been damaged, and if so, how much by the Formula One issue? Well, with great respect, Tony Blair is a political opponent but he's also Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. I'm not going to criticise Tony Blair abroad. I'm, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, I think that's a matter left best for domestic politics. Do you agree, then, that there is a feeling in this country that Britain is full of confidence, full of self-esteem, the economy goes well, there is a sense that London is a city that everybody wants to come to, business is good, the attitude is good, uh, this is a, for the lack of a better word, a happening place. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. And, and the Labour Party are jolly lucky to inherit all that from us. <laughs> Extremely lucky. It has nothing because to do with exactly the position. It has nothing, to do. <laughs> exactly the position it has nothing to do with a new attitude and a new government and Labour coming in and new Labour oh. creating a new sense of. It was there. It was coming. So good. You, don't, you don't suddenly change attitudes unless you change economic realities. They didn't change economic realities. We changed economic realities. So we put people back to work and had living standards rising and got our kids better educated. They've inherited that. And they're very fortunate to have inherited it. You Sometimes you're lucky in politics. They were lucky. It, but, but we did that, <laughs> not right. them. So you're saying that if you like Britain today and if you like London today and if you feel good about it, thank what we did over you the past. You should feel good about it. London and the UK is in better economic shape at the moment than it has been for a very long time. And if the government follows sensible policies, I think that's going to remain the case for some time because the fundamentals of the British economy are very strong. Uh, we are very, very competitive at the moment as an industrial uh, nation, a little less competitive than we were as uh, uh, the sterling exchange rate has, uh, has risen so much over the last few months. But basically, we're a pretty competitive, pretty lean, pretty fit nation just right now. You had, um, I would assume, the great honor as leader of your country to participate in a whole series of conferences, especially the group of seven. Mm. Um, when you look around, in which you would have people in Japan mm. and, and lay at, after you left, or the most recent one where um, Yeltsin participated, when you look at the world today uh, and the process of globalization, are you optimistic? And, what, and if where you are not optimistic, what worries you? Yes, I'm overwhelmingly optimistic. Um, I think there are some worries, but I'm generally uh, optimistic. What worries you? Uh, well, I'll, may okay, may I say, sorry, sure, I'll come to the worry sorry. second, if I may. I think in terms of globalization, you're seeing some of the developing companies, uh, I use the term loosely, Brazil, Indonesia, developing countries. Russia, countries, right. China, Brazil. Uh, there are four or five countries that have one half of the world's uh, labor force and only 8 to 10 percent of the world's production. That's going to double that share of the world's production is going to double in the next 20 years. Now, that is not only improving their living standards, it's, it's going to lift a lot of nations out of poverty, 
a lot of the nations in the United Nations who are in poverty at the moment are going to be lifted out by economic growth in the next 10 or 15 years. That's a thoroughly good thing. The world's market is getting bigger and bigger. That's a thoroughly good thing. Across Latin America and across Central and Eastern Europe, countries are industrializing that were in a dreadful state not all that many years ago. There are some problems. I suppose one would be worried about whether Japan is going to come out of its difficulties. That's clearly a problem. One would be worried about whether the euro, if it goes ahead, as I'm sure it will now go ahead, is a success or if it's a failure. But the United States is in prime economic health. The United Kingdom is in very good economic health. Uh, I, I think if uh, no economic cycle is permanent, of yeah. course there are highs and there are lows. But by and large, I think the prospects ahead are on the bright side, not on the dark side. You worry about South Korea and North Korea. South Korea, well, one for economics well, I would, and one I for instability. I would worry about them for different reasons. Yeah. I mean, the instability of North Korea is a real worry. I mean, heaven alone knows what is actually going on inside North Korea. It's still a pretty closed, uh, it's still a pretty closed state, pretty closed nation, and potentially a very destabilizing and dangerous one. And of course, the South Korean economy has been a miracle over the past 20 years, but a miracle that's run into difficulties. So I think there is, there is a reason to worry. There are points you can worry about. You can worry about the danger of regional wars. Well, I want to speak to that. The one thing I did not, I'm surprised, I mean, I might have thought that you might have said that your regret was that you were not able to do more in Bosnia, notwithstanding the fact that, that brave soldiers mm. from went there uh, well, we had representing Britain and served as peacekeeper. Notwithstanding I that, it, why it took so long and so much ethnic cleansing before they were able to stop the killing there? Well, I'll tell you. When Bosnia began and those age-old hatreds and rivalries burst forth, I think from memory I was the first Western head of government to send troops there. I remember coming back from a holiday, I think it was in Portugal, and sending troops there. And when I did so, I remember having a meeting with uh, my generals and uh, uh, senior military officers in Downing Street. And I said to them, here's Bosnia, here's ethnic cleansing. What do we actually need to hold the warring parties apart? How many troops do we need to put in there to do that? And they sucked their teeth a bit and came back with the answer of around 400,000 troops. And how long would you have to keep them there, I said. Perhaps indefinitely, they said, if you're going to do it by putting in troops and holding them apart. Britain doesn't have 400,000 troops. Without the United States, without the other members of NATO, we couldn't have got remotely near that number. Even with them, you couldn't have put in that number of troops and kept them there. So what we did, what British did, was to put in troops. We put them in first for almost the whole period we were there. We had the largest troop contingent until pretty near the end when the United States did, even proportionately we did. I think when I left office in May, we'd spent something like 13,000 million pounds sterling on supporting the uh, creation and maintenance of peace in Bosnia. But it is very difficult to say a great deal more could have been done without a much larger international effort. And if that larger international effort had solely been military, it might have stayed there for a very long time. We've had troops in Cyprus for 29 years between North and South. So it was necessary to deal with it politically, and that, in the end, is what happened. But with great respect for what those brave soldiers did and the decisions that you took, uh, the question still remains uh, that when they began to use the bombing, it seems that they began to get the attention of the parties necessary necessary to result in the diplomatic victory that took place. At least it still yes. holds in with date. Respect, I don't agree with that judgment. I mean, with respect, I don't agree with that judgment. Are the threat if you of look force... At, if, if you look at the topography of the whole of Bosnia, it isn't Iraq. You've not got it, great flatlands that you can justifiably bomb. The military advice that I got, and others got as well, was that bombing in Yugoslavia is a much more, oh, former Yugoslavia, Bosnia, is a much more haphazard thing. You're never quite sure what you're exactly going to hit. It didn't have the same potential force as it could have had in a much Appreciate flatter it, area like Iraq. Why so it then, was different. I understand the difference. But why then did you get the result that you got, finally? Oh, but it was, it was what a What changed no. then that I think there had to have so much atrocities in between? Well, I'm afraid partly it was war weariness. Right. It wasn't, it, was, it, it wasn't necessarily the milk of human kindness amongst the warring but, parties. Oh, but um, that's my a, very it, point. It wasn't it was the milk degree, of human kindness, but in fact wasn't. was the, with respect it, to... It was, well, I think it was partly war weariness. 
I think it was uh, the huge amount of diplomatic effort, effort. By that time, there were very large troop contingents there. I don't actually take the view that it was the degree of bombing that went on. I, I just don't take that view. But that is exactly what know. Richard Holbrook says and he I, threatened to do yeah, that, that made a difference with the parties well, in Dayton. I'd, I'd, ah, but you're coming to a particular point in Dayton rather, rather than the general movement. At the time of Dayton, no doubt it had an effect. But the belief that you could actually have bombed a settlement in Yugoslavia is defied by every military man that I have spoken to about this issue. They didn't believe that. Now, I'm a politician. I'm not a military man. I can't give you a military judgment of that. But their military judgment was that that, that wasn't a practical course. At the time of the particular Dayton Accords, where there was a huge amount of diplomatic pressure and people were beginning to misbehave, then a whole series of things come together. War weariness, despair at what has the happened, argument, the threat though, of bombing, all yeah, of those things yeah. together, not just one. Uh, and, and you can't look back and, in a sense, say what might have happened. But you can say, if the same forces had been put at back, war weariness might have been different. But could that have been achieved two years earlier? Because the Clinton administration did not take the leadership. The president acknowledges that he did not, that the position he campaigned on, he came back to later after trying to try other things in the interim, as you know. Well, well we were there all I, the time. Am, we were, but am I wrong about that? We, we were there all the time. You, well, we in terms of Britain in Bosnia. We were there in terms of Britain in Bosnia. And we the were United there actually States. trying to stop genocide and trying to stop people killing one another. And that's what British troops did. President Clinton very effectively campaigned against your friend, President Bush, uh, in terms of saying, we cannot stand by the way we have. And then they stood by and then changed the policy later. Uh, my point, I guess, is that it was seen only when they changed the policy back to which they promised that things began to come together. I think it was a combination of two things that brought it together. Uh, I, I don't accept the bombing point. I think the physical presence of troops on the ground right made a difference. That is certainly true. It made a difference because it impeded the warring parties. It, uh, it protected the civilian population. It prevented the movement of a certain amount of arms, not all of it, and, uh, and guns. There was the impounding of guns. All those things began to come together, together with the enormous amount of diplomatic effort. And the diplomatic effort coming, of course, from the United States, from uh, Russia, and from the uh, other Western European countries. Has everything that you have learned about Bosnia since you left office, since the end of, of the Dayton Accords, either confirmed what you decisions you made at the time or caused you to have some question that if you'd known certain facts, you might have operated differently? Oh, uh, I think always, in retrospect, you can think of some things you would have done differently. I mean, I, uh, I can't give you a great list of them now, but I, I can't conceive of uh, hardly uh, any politician looking at Bosnia at the huge uncertainties that existed in Bosnia, who might not have taken a different judgment at some stage in that conflict. I'll tell you what the great fear always was for me in Bosnia. The great fear in Bosnia was twofold. Firstly, that you, one would not be able to stop the genocide. But secondly, that the conflict would spread down south towards Kosovo. Right. And then it would not become a civil war within former Yugoslavia, but a trans-Balkan war, a regional on a war much, that could expand, a anywhere. regional war on a much bigger scale, and bring in right on the border, and bring in the Russians, that, and bring in the everybody. Well, conceivably, right. I didn't think it would bring in the Russians, but conceivably, and it was that fear that made me put in troops very early and encourage other Western allies to do the same. The, just one last point about that: allies in the Gulf War came together. Uh, in a very effective coalition building. Didn't seem to happen this time when the president had to face Saddam, except for Britain. Uh, in Bosnia, it didn't seem to come together as well. Is that a fair appraisal? Except for the United no, Britain. You're quite right. I mean, the distinction between the two, um, the two examples you cite, one, you had uh, the rape of Kuwait by a foreign country. You had a direct invasion of the sovereign territory of a country by another. That is a much easier proposition in international law for the then president to bring together a coalition. In the case of Bosnia, you had um, within a former single country, within former Yugoslavia, you had a civil war where ancient hatreds had, uh, had burst forth in a quite remarkable way and where you had a three-cornered war at least. 
and very difficult to see how it could be policed or how it could be dealt with. And I suppose it is also possible in some cases that having expended amongst so many countries so much effort on the Gulf and cost and loss of life, although mercifully not too great a loss of life in the Gulf, people were wary about doing it again when you were looking essentially at a civil war, not at a cross-border war, which is what you had in the Gulf. So I think there were a range of things. Now, Britain and France also, um, I didn't mention France also, but I think France had a very honourable role in putting in significant amounts of troops at a very early stage. In Bosnia? Keep, in Bosnia, and keeping a very high troop presence there throughout the conflict. More so than the United States, as a matter of Well, the United fact. States did a very great deal. I mean, the, What did we it, do before... Well, well um, it wasn't until the diplomatic clout of the United States came into force. But that was near the... Well, conclusion. You say the United States didn't do much. I'm no, no, defending I'm just your asking. country. I'm no, no, I'm, I'm, asking, I'm saying I think they did. Well, I, I'm asking what we did. That's I think they did. I'm not here to criticize the United States. I don't wish to. They're our foremost allies. But, but when nor the am I, States, in fact. I mean, the point is not to criticize. It is no, to understand because you were a when, player. When the United States began to use its, uh, um, its uh, uh, diplomatic muscle, and when the United States moved its troops in, there was an undeniable leader amongst the nations there in Bosnia. I rest now, my is, case then. That is undoubtedly... I the, rest my case in no, that case with, with respect, great respect. No, 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 you haven't let me finish. Okay. But you rest your case on the basis that the United States were taking no helpful action in advance of that. Now that I do not accept. No, I'm not saying no helpful that advice. That is but not I'm, what I But believe. you just said when the United States began to show its leadership and bring its diplomatic presence into it, then we ended up with a solution. That's what you said, and of it course. seems to me... But no, 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 but uh, with great respect, you're taking a part of the argument. As I said a few moments ago, <laughs> and we'll repeat again, when you move along a conflict like this, right. there isn't a single issue that suddenly changes it. It's a whole series of right. things that come together. And all the other matters I referred to came together as well at that time. Let me come back all to... All the other points, I won't run through the list again, but all those no, points no, came no, together. No, points well taken, I think everybody understood it. Let me go back to the Gulf one more time, yeah. because is there some risk, risk today, for lots of reasons? You look at the f impasse in the Middle East Oslo process now, that what gains there were that came together in the Gulf War coalition may be, may be lost or face the possibility of losing. So that those countries who came together at that time in that effort and might have faced a certain kind of realignment, in part produced by the fall of the Soviet Union, so that they were no longer a surrogate for the Iraqis, that we face a real challenge in the Gulf because that coalition may have been frayed and unraveling and some Arab states who might have been there for us and for the West might not be there next time out. I think it would be the case if, for example, to go back to our earlier argument, if we had actually gone ahead in 1992 and uh, 1991 and actually gone into Baghdad in the way you were asking me about earlier, then I think you would have fractured the Western democracy-Arab relationship to such a stage that at a future crisis you would not be able to cobble together a coalition. Right. I think that is true. And that is why I think it was wise of the Western allies to stop as they did, even though many people, with hindsight, chose to criticize it. At the moment, it would clearly be desirable if there was more public support of the United States-British position as far as Saddam Hussein is concerned. I wish there were more support. There ought to be, in logic, more support. I suspect there's a good deal of support in private, Exactly. But not in public right. because of uh, domestic the very thing Arab that considerations. Henry I, said on this broadcast I think at the that is exactly right. It's in private. The support is probably there, but they don't really want to uh, express that support too much in public, unless it becomes necessary to do so. Now, if the um, present problems in Iraq go the way they look as though they are likely to go as we speak right. this afternoon, and there is the return of inspectors, then I think all is well. It, for a while at least. If, on the other hand, if it did not go that way, and if the United States and Britain were forced into a position where there was a genuine danger of the weapons of mass production proceeding without proper inspection, 
then I think Britain and the United States would need to put a good deal more diplomatic effort on our former allies and upon the Security Council and upon the United Nations generally to make sure there was a bigger coalition to let Saddam Hussein know that his behavior is just intolerable. Mm. This is the last question. I'm, I'm, I'm run over, but I just ask this. In a sense, it's important. I'd like for you to sort of finish this for me. It's important for those in a position of leadership um, in this world that's facing the change as we end the, go towards the millennium with the kind of regional regionalization taking place, the kind of ethnic rivalries that taking place. It's important for leadership to do what? Whether it's a so it's the single remaining superpower of the United States, whether it's a great nation with a great tradition like Great Britain uh, and other places, to do what in facing the challenge of today? Well, the old traditional borders are falling away. The Warsaw Pact no longer exists. NATO is moving gently, and it is wise to go cautiously further across Europe. There's more e economic intermingling. If you really wish to know what will make our world the most, um, a more secure place in the next 20 years, the single thing that will do it, I actually believe the single, single thing that will do it will be the increasing and dramatic spread of free trade everywhere. Because once you have those, that intermingling of trade, you have a community of interest that militates against military conflict. To give you an illustration of that, for 700 years, Western Europe fought continually against one another. The intermingling of trade in Western Europe makes that inconceivable. And yet the world is generally shrinking. The intermingling of trade with other parts of the world is increasing day after day after day. The more that increases, the more there's a community of interest. And one other thing that people tend not to remark upon, and I hope you don't think it a flippant point to make. Today, President Clinton or uh, Prime Minister uh, Tony Blair could pick up the phone and speak on first name terms to 50 heads of government. They know one another. They're not distant countries with whom they disagree that are a long way away. They're flesh and blood people whom they meet and who they do business with. President Bush did a huge amount of telephone diplomacy. I know President Clinton does the same. That much greater capacity amongst uh, heads of government to meet at international conferences, and many people say are a waste of time, to know one another, to have a flesh and blood contact, I think is very reassuring. It removes many of the hatreds, fears, and uncertainties that often triggered great disputes in the past. So let us have that diplomacy continue even if at some stage you get boring conferences at which nothing happens. Let's have the uh, growth of trade and the intermingling of interests. And I think the more that progresses, the more you will see a relative subsidence in military conflict. I thank you for this hour. Uh, we went to go 30 minutes, we went an hour, and, and uh, I thank you very much. It's been, I yeah. think, for my audience and for me, an opportunity to hear from someone uh, who occupied center stage and how they reflect on both history and the present. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you for joining us from London, former Prime Minister John Major. We'll see you tomorrow night.